<laughs> Hi, and we are live from the Eve Walk Congress in Lisbon, and I am joined with um, by Professor Farah Sadad, the editor in chief of the Berlin Joint Journal. Faris is just going to talk to us for a few minutes today in between the many, many sessions that he's speaking at. So we're really grateful for his time. Um, and I just wanted to talk to Faris about robotics. Uh, we covered infection last time, and I know that Faris is using robotics increasingly in his, um, in his practice, and I was just wondering if that's something we're going to see a lot more of in orthopedics. Thanks, Emma, and good morning to everybody. I think it is. I think it's a great question because we've reached a stage where we're seeing more and more enhanced technologies uh, around us in the whole of orthopedics and the trauma world. Uh, but particularly in my area of knee surgery, I think we've reached a stage where computer-assisted surgery and enhanced technology using robotics is getting a real foothold. So whenever I go to a meeting, there are an increasing number of presentations, an increasing number of industry exhibits that are profiling this, these technologies. And we're increasingly seeing papers coming through to the journal looking at these. So when we look at the, the bigger picture of how to help our patients, uh, the reality is there are many facets to that, including selecting the right patients, including making sure the right institution that we're using the right implants, but ultimately helping the surgeon to execute the correct plan uh, has to be high on our list of priorities. And I think we're at a stage where these technologies are going to help us do that. We've um, certainly seen in the journal data from unis, data from total knees. We've got a couple more papers coming up and increasingly some data from hips to suggest that we are getting better at three-dimensional planning, we're getting better at executing those plans, and that they are starting to make a short-term difference to patient outcomes. And it's probably only a question of time till we can measure health economic differences from using these technologies in order to help patients and reduce revisions, readmissions, and other problems down the road. It's an exciting time. And I just wanted to cover something obviously very much related to publishing in the Bone and Joint Journal. In this era that we're in where Plan S is on the horizon and we're, we're looking at open publication, how do we define quality? How, how are our readers going to be able to find journals and papers that are actually um, proper science and not, not the junk science that we're seeing so, so much increasing in the world? Yeah, thanks Emma. I think that's a really important question. That It's a challenge that we all face in one way or another. We're, we're at a big meeting now and as we go around the various lectures, we'll see some really good material presented and some really good material referenced, but also we'll see that people will reference some very poor quality material that's been poorly peer reviewed or published really without scrutiny just to support their point. And, and we see industry and others sometimes capitalizing on that. And there's no question that industry supports some very good research, but also the fact that things can get published without good peer review and good scrutiny is a problem. So for all the benefits of open publishing and the fact that's the direction we're heading in, it's, it's good that good research is seen by everyone and can be disseminated easily. The reality is there needs to be a level of caution around what material you believe. And in terms of the publishing world, you have to really look at those journals that have robust peer review processes that ensure that the material presented has been appropriately registered, has been appropriately studied and reported, and keep that bar at a high level. We're in danger in an open social media fueled world of believing a whole load of things that are put out there either in social fora or in non-reputable journals, the so-called junk science, or even in preprint service sometimes where they haven't been through peer review, when actually they have not really undergone the scrutiny and the improvements that they need in order to be reported to the wider population and to potentially change practice. So I think each and, each and every one of us is beholden to, look, beholden to look at the evidence out there and select that evidence that's been uh, rigorous, uh, rigorously looked at and that is methodologically sound before we influence patient care. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for, for joining us. And also we have a publishing session tomorrow at the EFORT Congress. So if you're out here in Lisbon, do join us because I'm sure we'll be covering lots more topics that are very relevant to all of you. So thanks for joining us. Thank you, Emma.